I'm telling you, man, this is going to be great. And if you want to see more of me, you got to go to Anaheim. You guys got the point, right? Well, I want to bring out our last guest. Everyone knows this man, Alex Bloomberg. Alex is very popular with his podcast, Startup. Also, Alex has a very rich history with production. He was producer of This American Life, not only the TV, but the radio. Obviously, Alex is going to bring it today as we go into this last session. I want you to help me to bring him out with a lot of excitement. So let's give a round of applause and bring out Alex Bloomberg. Especially given that I'm going to be talking about genocide. I'm serious. I'm a little nervous about it, but there's a point. Uh, not the whole speech. The speech is going to start funny. It's going to end funny. But there's going to be some genocide in the middle. <laughs> Hope it goes OK. Um, so and I have slides and audio. All right. There we go. Should be up now. There we go. All right. So I'm going to start here. Um, and I'm going to make sure I don't go over with the timer that has now started. Uh, a lot of times I bring the timer up, and then, um, and then I'll, like, get, I'll put it out on the thing, and I'll get going, and then I'll get, I'll get to about like, sort of where I'm about to wind down, and I'll look at the timer, and I'll realize I haven't started it. That doesn't do any good. Any, anybody any good? All right, so, um, so I want to uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled uh, to be at this, uh, I, I, you know, at the dawn of a second golden age of, of audio. Uh, and I think all of us in this room feel this excitement. Um, and I want to start my talk with a, with a story arc that I think we're all familiar with, um, a story arc that has helped define our young industry. An intrepid podcast host is confronted with a question. The question becomes an obsession. Uh, and over multiple episodes, the podcast host goes back to investigate the question, to find out what really happened and why. Episode after episode, new information is revealed. You probably already figured out which podcast I'm referring to. It's a podcast called My Dad Wrote a Porno. <laughs> uh, you guys heard it? Here's the, here's the beginning of the first episode. Jamie, why are we here? We're here because my dad's written a porno. Your dad's written a porno. Erotic literature. Well, why? why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the premise for you, for those of you who don't know, is this guy Jamie. He invites his two old friends, uh, Alice and James, to his kitchen table, uh, where each episode they record themselves reading aloud and discussing Jamie's father's self-published erotic novel. Jamie's father's name is Rocky, uh, and his book is called Belinda Blinked. Uh, and basically, they just, each episode, they read different passages, and they laugh about the crazy, stilted language that their father uses, and the insane metaphors, and Jamie's father, Rocky's seemingly poor grasp on the basics of female anatomy. It only took Peter Rouse 25 seconds to remove his clothes and position himself beside Belinda on the bed. He grabbed her cervix. <gasps> oh, I have to say something here. He's going to kill her. <laughs> He's actually going to do some serious internal damage. And if we don't stop him, I don't know who will. Oh, my God. I don't think Rocky's the only one that's ignorant about the cervix. So I'm just going to Google for you really quick. Do you see that bracketed area? That's vagina. Yes. Okay. Looks like a map of the UK. Okay, that we have to deal with later. I can, I'll do geography next time. So, the cervix isn't part of the vagina, guys, okay? okay. The cervix, as you can see, <gasps> is almost grazing the lung. If you're grabbing that, you've gone wrong. Uh, 
So I heard about my dad wrote a porno from one of the shows that we produce at Gimlet, Sampler. Uh, uh, Sampler is a show that curates the best moments from the world of podcasts. So shout out to them. Um, uh, and I'm starting this talk with it because I think it perfectly encapsulates this wonderful new world we're in. Um, the world that on-demand audio and these things, our smartphones, has created. Um, before the smartphone and before the podcast, what would Jamie have done with his dad's porno novel? What could he have done? There's nothing for him. There's no expression that can sort of that can really get at the pleasure, the craziness, the weirdness of this thing that happened to him, like a podcast. And it's sort of the perfect expression of that. And of course, you know, my dad wrote a porno. It was just one of any number of things that this new world has created. Uh, there's fiction podcasts. There's famous astrophysicists doing podcasts, interviewing comedians. When would that have ever happened in history? Best-selling authors are deciding not to write books but do podcasts instead. Uh, there's podcasts about pop culture, which are far ahead of the, nas of the nation's um, preoccupation with Beyonce. There's, uh, there's recaps. There's every sub-niche that you can imagine. There's a podcast called Window to the Magic, which is literally a guy going and recording himself walking around Disneyland and Disney World. That's all it is. And it has like something like 200 episodes. Uh, there's religion and spirituality. There's business, of course. What, you thought I wasn't going to do one on my own? And uh, there's comedy. Uh, absolutely. Since we're in Chicago, I, I chose a, a Chicago-based Hello, uh, Hello from the Magic Tavern. Anybody familiar with it? Um, just as an aside, just as an aside, one of the things, this isn't the main point, this isn't the genocide part, one of the main points of, uh, that I think, that I love about podcasts in this world, what this enables, this, this sort of regular time-shifted listening experience enables, is that you can have these things that just sort of become jokes that grow on themselves, you know? And like, after a while, you're like, oh, I'm waiting for it, I'm waiting for it, I'm waiting for it. And, what, and Hello from the Magic Tavern is one of those. So the idea of Hello from the Magic Tavern, just as a quick aside, it's a fictional podcast where the host, Arnie Niekamp, the conceit is that he's fallen through a dimensional porthole behind a Burger King into a magic land called Foon, but he uh, has a Wi-Fi signal from the Burger King through which he does his podcast every week. And uh, he does the podcast from a, a, a tavern called the Vermilion Minotaur. This will all be worth it, I hope. From a, a tavern called the Vermilion Minotaur, and he's joined each week by these two guests in the land of Foon, Shunt, the talking badger, and the wizard, Usador. And he does it every single time. He does that intro every single time, and Shunt comes on every single time, and the wizard, Usador, comes on every single time, and this is how he introduces himself every single time. And I am Usador, wizard of the twelfth realm of Ephesius, master of light and shadow, manipulator of magical delights, devourer of chaos, champion of the great halls of Tarakas. The elves know me as Fiang Yalak, the dwarves know me as Zodan and Hookstangis, and I am known in the northeast as Gasmoenius Maestar. And there may be other secret names that I shall ne'er reveal. Every time. 60 episodes, never gets old to me. Uh, all right, so clearly, if, if, my, if my first slide wasn't proof enough, that should be proof that we are at the dawn of a new golden age of audio. Um, and we're just at the beginning. And just as a reminder, the first golden age of audio looked like this. Um, it was uh, in, the, in the 30s and 40s, and it, it was when every major talent in, in, in the world came to the radio to, to do their thing. There were talk shows, there were comedy shows, there were dramas, there was The Lone Ranger and The Shadow, and a lot of very famous people got their start in radio. Bob Hope, Groucho Marx, uh, Orson Welles, all started on radio. Um, big companies, NBC, CBS, ABC, all started on radio in the golden age of radio, right? And then the TV came along, and so you see that girl sitting there, right? This is what families would do. They would gather around their radio and sit and listen and look at the radio. And then the TV came along, which is a much better thing to look at because <laughs> it has moving pictures on it. Uh, and so that sort of wiped away the radio. And like all this amazing sort of flowering of talent and excitement and innovation that was happening in this medium sort of went by the wayside. And then it was just basically music and talk. And everything went to TV. Now we're back, right? Now, because we are now able to listen while we do other things, 
You can't do that with any other medium. You can't drive and watch, at least until self-driving cars come along. You can't work out and, and, re, and watch. You can't, you can't run errands and read an article. You can, do all, you can listen to audio doing all that, and that is what has enabled this, this golden age. And that is great for me, because I believe that audio is, is better at certain things. <laughs> what happened? Did I, did I do something? Or were you just laughing at, the, at my weird pause? Uh, I believe that audio is better at certain things than any other form of media. Um, and uh, that's what I want to talk about now. This is a, so I'm going to play a little bit of, I'm going to play t audio all through from very, various times in my sort of producing career. I used to work as a producer at This American Life a long time ago. This is a little clip from, from This American Life, and it sort of perfectly encapsulates, I think, one of the great strengths of audio. Um, so to set it up, there's a guy named Tate Donovan. Anybody know who Tate Donovan is? Okay, Tate Donovan is a, was, a, was a character actor from the 90s. Nobody knew him then either, except he had this one brief period where he was a, where he was a regular guest on the, on the TV show Friends. So he was on Friends. And all of a sudden, he started getting recognized. And that was great for Tate Donovan because uh, he finally got to be the kind of star that he'd always wanted to be, which was man of the people magnanimous. Like, that's what he wanted. He was like, if I ever get famous, I'm not going to forget the little people. I'm going to show them my love every single time. I'm going to sign autographs. I'm going to kiss babies. I'm going to pose for photographs. And so now he has a chance to be that great guy. Um, and one night, he's at a a premiere of a show, uh, and people are coming up and asking for his autograph, he's posing for pictures, um, and uh, it's awesome for him. I was, ex I, was, I was exactly how I wanted to be. I was doing it, I was doing great. And then the kid with the camera came along. <laughs> This nervous kid, I don't know, he must have been 16 years old. He's in a rented tuxedo, unbelievably, like, shy and awkward, and he's got, like, acne, and he's got a camera in his hand. And underneath the marquee is his date, who is literally like a prom dress, and she's got a corsage, and she's really, you know, nervous and sort of clutching her hands. And he sort of comes up to me, and he sort of mumbles, you know, something like, you know, something about a picture. And I'm like, oh, I just feel for him. So I'm like, oh, absolutely, my gosh, sure. I have no problem, my God, you poor thing. And, and I go up to his, to his girlfriend, I wrap my arms around her, and I'm like, hey, where are you from? Fantastic guy, uh, going to see the play, that's great. And the guy is sort of not taking the photograph very quickly. He's just sort of staring at me, and he's got his camera in his hands, and it's down by his, like, chin, you know? And, and uh, she's very stiff and awkward, and. I, you know, I don't know what to do, so I just lean across and I, I kiss her on the cheek. And I'm like, all right, come on, take the picture, hurry up. Do you guys want to find out what happens next? <laughs> so that is the power of audio right there. <laughs> this is a story about nothing, right? There's nothing important happening here. There's no genocide in this one either. It's coming. Uh, <laughs> but the simple act of this of, of, a, of a sequence of actions leading to a climax has us all hooked. So I, before we get to, uh, before you lose the train, I'll, I'll, I'll take you out of misery now, I'll play, I'll go back a little bit and I'll play and, and then we can hear the end and then I'll talk more about this. You know, I don't know what to do, so I just lean across and I, I kiss her on the cheek. And I'm like, all right, come on, take the picture, hurry up. And, and finally he sort of like snaps it and I'm like, okay, it was really wonderful to meet you. And he just like st stammered over to me and was like, um, could you take a picture of us? <laughs> and the whole time, he just wanted me to take a picture of him and his girlfriend underneath the awning of the play. He didn't want a picture of me. He had no idea who I was. <laughs> <laughs> That right there, I think, is one perfect encapsulation of what audio is, is fantastic at, narrative, right? That is a pure distillation of narrative. We, you, all that happened was this guy was telling a sequence of events. It starts here, it starts at the theater, then a kid comes up with a camera, and then he, they have an exchange, he takes the camera, and it's like we are hardwired to listen to that shit. 
because we are human. If there is something, if somebody starts with a sequence of actions, today, you know what I did? I walked out of my house today, and I was walking down the street, and I looked up at the sky. You guys want to know what I saw. It's just that simple, right? Like that is the, that we are hardwired to want to consume that stuff. And then there's other elements, obviously. Like if I say, you'll never guess what I saw, a cloud, that's not a good story, right? But if I say, you'll never guess what I saw, a UFO, that's a good story, right? There's a, there's a twist. So like the other element of a good story is that there's the sequence of actions and the reveal that it leads to, the, the change, the punchline, whatever you want to call it, is something interesting, is something surprising, is something revealing. And then the final element of that story is you know there's a little bit of like, how did, how did that make that guy feel? He doesn't say that much. All he says is, oh. That's all you need to say, right? You know that he feels there's been a brief moment of reflection. So you have this rising action, the sequence of actions. You have this, what I sort of think of as the punchline, even though it's not often funny, it's often something else. And then you have this moment of, of reflection. And that is so hardwired into us. That's something that we have been doing since almost the beginning of recorded memory. Um, if you look, this is uh, the first chapter of the book of Genesis. And if you look at that, I had this theory when I was giving one of these speeches, and I actually went and looked at it. And it's like almost perfectly encapsulates. Clearly, this was something that was spoken out loud before it was ever written down. This was a story that we told ourselves over and over and over again. And it follows perfectly everything that I just laid out. There's a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless, darkness was over the surface, and God said, let there be light. When, when, Ira first, when I first started working at This American Life, Ira always told me, you know you're getting great tape if they're quoting dialogue to you. <laughs> if somebody says, and then I told him, and then, the, and, then, and then she told me, you know you're onto something. And that's right here. God said, let there be light, and there is light. Um, the other thing that makes a great story is like the telling detail. In the Tate Donovan story, it was like the smooch. There was, there was, like, uh, there was the kid with the camera around his neck. She was in a prom dress. There's all these details that you can hang on to. Again, God created this thing. What did, he, what did he call it? He called it day, specificity. The darkness he called night. First time the story was told, they didn't know what these were called, right? This was, a, this was brand new. Um, there's a rising action, and then we get to the punchline or the revelation. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea. That's what the point of the story is, us. And then there's even a moment of reflection. How did God feel about it all at the end? He felt good. <laughs> also, he felt tired. Um, so obviously, right, so this is something that is hardwired. Narrative, the instinct for narrative is hardwired into us. There's one other thing that audio is great at. And that is com uh, companionship. So a little question, how many people, um, how many people who've listened to startup feel, okay, great. How many of you, <laughs> How many of you who listen to Startup feel like you know me even though you've never met me? Right, okay. Um, how about other things, other podcasts that you listen to? How many of the people on those other podcasts, do you, have you ever had the thought about a podcast that you listen to and love? Man, if I bet if we lived in the same town or I knew that person, we'd be friends. <laughs> Has anybody ever thought that? <laughs> right? Be, when you listen to somebody, you, it is a very intimate bond that is formed. Um, I feel it. I've, I, I want to know that guy who plays Usador so bad. Are you here? Yeah. You got, yeah. I don't care about you, Arnie. I just want Usador. No, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> no, no I'll, you'll do. I'll see you after. Uh, so, uh, so, um, and so, that's, and so companionship is a huge part of this. Um, and it's one of the reasons that like, you, can, you sort of like, are along with the journey. I'm going to play one clip from Startup. Maybe, maybe you're familiar with it. It was a clip when we were 
trying to name the company. It was episode five, and uh, I'd gone out with my co-founder, Matt. We couldn't come up with a name, couldn't come up with a name, months and months and months. We finally went to his backyard and sat around, and, and we were just like, we're going to come up with a name. We spent three hours just sort of like going down rabbit holes. We went into sort of foreign language Google Translate things about like <laughs> different foreign language words for audio. And finally, after like four hours, we came up with it. I came home, and I told my wife, Nazanin, we finally have the name, Orello. Arello? <laughs> Arello. What is that? What is that supposed to mean? Well, it's uh, it's ear in Esperanto. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> That's so dumb. It's good though, right? <laughs> what? Whose idea was that? It came up organically. How does that come up organically? I was like. Speaking Esperanto? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, those two elements of, of audio story and companionship, that intimacy, that bond that's created between the person, on, the person in audio and the person that you're listening to, that is so powerful. It's so powerful that in the wrong hands, it can lead to genocide. Um, and I want to talk about this because I feel like this is really, really important. If you remember, this is where we get to the genocide. We're going to be here for a little bit, and then we're going to leave. But, but I, I, I believe it very deeply, and I thought about talking about this, and I think it's something that I believe a lot in, and so I, I'm going to do it. Um, there, the Rwanda genocide, for those of you who may not remember, took place in Rwanda in the mid-90s. There was one ethnic group, the Hutus, who systematically murdered another ethnic group, the Tutsis, plus a very large number of moderate Hutus. And between a half a million and a million people were killed by Hutu militias, but also by civilians armed with crude weapons and machetes. And a big inciter of all this violence was a radio station called the RTLM, which stands for a Thousand Hills Free Radio. It was bankrolled by Hutu extremists. The DJs played popular music, they cracked jokes, people loved it, and they told very powerful narratives of this history of Hutu abuse at the hands of the Tutsi. See, the Tutsis had been put in control of Rwanda by European colonizers, first Germany, then by, by Belgium, and then Hutus had eventually won their freedom, and then, then they were sort of in this civil war, and they were finally on the, on, the, on the verge of a ceasefire, and there was this fear among Hutu extremists that if the Tutsis came back into power, they'd retaliate against the Hutus. And the RTM told the story over and over and over. The Tutsis wanted to enslave the Hutu majority. The only way to be safe was to exterminate Hutus. They use that word a lot. They used the code word, cut down the trees. And in one of the more famous broadcasts, one of the presenters said, in the midst of the genocide, in the midst of people being hacked apart, he said, you have to work harder. The graves are not full. A Harvard researcher found that radio alone accounted for nearly 10% of the casualties. Um, 51,000 people. Um, people have looked at this in other genocides. In Nazi Germany, same thing happened. During the consolidation of the dictatorship, radio propaganda helped the Nazis enroll new party members. After the Nazis established their rule, radio propaganda incited anti-Semitic acts and den denunciation of Jews. So that is the power of audio in the wrong hands or used the wrong way. I'm sure many people who have seen Spider-Man movies know what comes with great power. Uh, if you haven't, great responsibility. I'm going to get to that.
then. Um, the thing, though, that's interesting is that that same researchers found that previous, in a, a couple years earlier, when Nazism was on the rise in Germany, but there was a countervailing uh, radio narrative, that it actually slowed the rise of Nazism. Um, there was another radio station that was talking about other stuff, and the growth of Nazi popularity slowed down in areas with access to that radio. So audio and the connection that it forms between the listener and the host and the power it has to tell story can both promote the rise of hatred, but can also protect against it. And I think, actually, because it has the power to promote the rise of hatred and intolerance, in that ability is also its greatest strength to fight against those things. Um, I think, actually, fighting against those things, I think, actually, no form of media is better able to fight against those things than audio. Um, I think, and this is what I believe is audio's greatest power. I'll ask another question. How many of the people who listened to Startup um, but have not seen me? Uh, how many people had a completely different vision of what I looked like? How many people are looking at me and are like, ah, no, <laughs> that's not what you are at all. I can tell you it happened very powerfully with me and Arnie. Did not know about the beard, man. Did not know about the beard. <laughs> it's freaking me out. Um, and, uh, and I think that is, that, and that I think gets to audio's greatest power. So you're hearing me. You're hearing my actual words, but you don't see me. And so you do what humans do, which is you create a version of me in your brain to say those words to you. And because of that, because of that, because you are listening to me, but also creating me as you listen, I quite literally become a small part of you. And that enables you to hear what I'm saying with more empathy. I think this, this is the greatest power of audio. Um, I want to play a couple clips. The first is from the podcast, Another Round, uh, who you just heard from. Uh, and they actually played a, a clip from that amazing interview with Clitzer Shields. I want to play a different clip. It's, just a, it's, it's, a, it's, like, it's a minute long. Um, it is an amazing episode. You guys should all go listen to it. They're right. And, uh, and, um, and this clip, uh, Tracy asks Clarissa, so Clarissa is an uh, 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 Olympic gold medal boxer. Right, she won gold last Olympics. She's going to compete again this this year. Um, and Tracy asks Clarissa, Clarissa about the town she grew up in, Flint, Michigan. I want you to tell me what Flint is like. What was it like growing up there for you? Every kid on the block, parents knew each other. Everybody talked to each other. But as the years went on, as I got older, probably from the age of eight to maybe twelve, we see a lot of changes within that four years. And um, at the age of six till about eight, I stayed with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. If I was mm -hmm. acting out of line, one of, the, one of the other parents would grab me like, hey, I'm gonna tell your grandma. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like, you know, you just let kids be out of order. They all looked out for each other. If one, if somebody kid got in trouble for something at the store, one of the other parents pulled up on the block like, hey, that's, hey, that's my kid. Mm -hmm. Please don't take him to jail. I got him. Thank you so much, officer. And it's not their child, but it's their child, you know? Yeah. You can kind of see as the years went on, kids on the block started separating away from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that was uh, because of the murders mm -hmm. in Flint. People were losing their big brothers, their uncles, their cousins to gun violence. And really, you know, as kids, you don't really know how to cope with that stuff. You don't know how to, you know, go from waking up to your big brother every morning mm -hmm. to now you never get to see him again till you, till you pass away. Right. That was kind of when family started being like, our family is our family, we're gonna look out for our family. Cause Flint is so small, maybe the person's son down the street is the guy that killed your son, so now you're, no. Right. There was so, I mean, if you, if you see in the media, you know, 60 murders 
a year, you know, 70 murders a year, all in this one little neighborhood. So, you know, I feel like because as I'm listening, I'm creating an, an image in, of, of, of Clarissa in my mind, I'm maybe a little bit more receptive to what she's saying than if I was watching her on TV or I was reading about her in the newspaper. Because she is, a, in a small sense, a part of me. I'm not saying I, I can now know oh, exactly what it was like to grow up like Clarissa did in Flint, Michigan, watching 60, you know, watching 60 people get murdered a year. Um, but I can, I can, I have a little bit more ability to empathize because I've been participating in this act of creation as I've been listening to her. As I was putting this talk together, I was reminded of this story that we did on This American Life a long time ago. Um, it's about this soldier, Sam Slavin, uh, who's this white guy. He'd seen a lot of violence, a lot of death in Iraq. And he'd been terrified. He'd gone through a couple of very, very terrified, terrifying incidents where people had died. He'd feared for his life. Um, and he developed this hatred and fear of Muslims. Uh, and he came back to civilian life. And he couldn't shake this hatred. Um, and this happens, right? You go through the trauma, and then the thing that reminds you of that trauma, that reminds you of that, it triggers the trauma. And this was happening to him a lot. And he described this one moment in particular where he saw this guy, Middle Eastern looking guy, just walking out of a building, and it nearly set him off. As I saw him there, and I, I thought, oh man, like, you know, there's another one of them. And, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, an instantaneous, you know, uh, a uh, rush of anxiety and adrenaline is like, well, what do I do? You know, uh, you know, and of course, you know, the thought of, you know, uh, ridden, ridding uh, him from uh, that situation was an option. And, and, uh, and. Wait, what do you mean? Well, you know, just, just choke him out or, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, take him in, you know, for questioning or something. But, uh, like, what, what am I doing? Like, you know, this isn't a war zone. Why, why am I even thinking this, you know, nonsense? You know, uh, I'm, you know, not armed. Uh, and I'm not a killer. I mean, I never was prior to the war. And all I know is just like, you know, wait, stop. S stand here a minute and think about it. You know, I want to say that I felt good, that nothing happened, but at the same time, I just, you know, just felt terrible. It was like, you know, what, what, what have I become? I mean, I didn't have any, you know, notions or thoughts about Muslims prior, prior to joining the army, but uh, I was like, why am I not like that anymore? And I was like, what, what can I do to get back to the way I was? You know, a, be a better person. So, and uh, I sat and thought, and you know, I, I, I looked up from the chair I was sitting at, and I saw a, a, a little poster on a bulletin board that said, you know, uh, learn learn about Islam, join join the Muslim Student Association. You know, it meets on Thursdays, and I thought, you know what, maybe that'd be good for me. Um. And so he does, and that's what the story is about. He ends up joining the Muslim Student Association in order to get over his internalized uh, racism against Muslims and meets a Muslim guy, and then it ends up working. Um, but I feel like that also, like I, I think a lot of people might have preconcep preconceptions about a white military guy comes back from Iraq, is literally admitting that he is like feeling hatred and anger towards every Middle Eastern looking person he's seeing. And, and yet, because we hear his voice, and we can hear the, the emotion he's wrestling with, this, his own internal conflict, and we're also sort of creating this image of, of, of him in our minds, we can somehow empathize with that a little bit more, I think, than than if, than if it was some other, other media. Um, and I think there's one 
There's one, I think, more clue to maybe why this is. Um, there's a study that I used to quote a lot uh, that I, I heard about, and then I would quote it sometimes, and then I was like, wait, is this even true? And then I quoted about it, and then somebody actually found it for me later. Um, and so it's an actual study that actually exists. It's called the, the truth test. And um, these researchers planted a lie in three different, um, three different uh, mediums, in TV, uh, radio, and, and print. And, um, and then they asked, they quizzed people on who was able to detect the lie. And what they found is that radio listeners detected the lies almost three quarters of the time, whereas new, newspaper readers were less and television viewers were about 50%, were 50-50, about being able to detect a lie. It is harder to lie through audio. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure why that is. They don't really know why that is. I think it has something to do with we're also a very visual species, and so people who get good at lying get good at lying visually and don't pay as much attention to their voices. So partly it's just habit. Good liars practice visually. They don't practice aud auditorily. But I think also partly it's because everything else is stripped away. All you have is your ears, and so you're just listening, and you can hear emotional truth. And as a radio producer who spent many, many years trying to get good tape, honest tape and good tape are the same thing. And false tape is never good tape. And that's why it's so hard to do, <laughs> to do good radio with politicians, because they never speak honestly. They never speak authentically. They never speak from the heart. That's actually, again, Heaven and Tracy, they did that interview with Hillary Clinton, they got her to talk like a human being. It was amazing. It comes at the very end, but it is well worth it. It's amazing. Uh, but it just never happens. And you can hear it in, when somebody, you can hear when somebody is telling you something that they believe to be true that has an emotional truth to it. And so I think all these things are related, right? We can hear emotional truth. We, 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 are, we are creating people in our minds, so that makes it a little bit easier for us to empathize. I think that is what makes audio so particularly vital right now. As all this crazy stuff is happening all around us. Um, and there's something really profound in that last clip from Sam. I think hatred often comes from a place of fear and pain. Um, and one of the things that keeps fear and pain from turning to hatred is empathy. That's what Sam was trying to do, right? He saw this hatred growing inside himself, and he tried to empathize with the, the people he feared to stop it if he could. And I feel like if we can try to empathize with the people we fear, or with the people who maybe fear us. We can take fear and pain and turn it away from hatred. And I think no other tool is better equipped to aid in that mission than audio. I don't think there's a better medium to help with empathy than audio. So that's the great power that we all have, to be agents of understanding, agents of empathy, because the world certainly needs that right now. Thank you. Hey! In 2017, podcast movement is hitting the road as we make our way to the West Coast. Spend some of your summer with us at the beautiful Anaheim Marriott in Anaheim, California. Join us August 23rd through the 25th as Podcast Movement does it better than ever. We'll once again have amazing featured speakers and all of your best podcaster friends from all around the world. All that's missing is you. Register today and we'll see you in California. Too late, I went, countdown, blast off, strapped up, strapped in.
And now it's powder like my heart, just like the rhythm in the street. My body grooving from my head to my feet. Just feel the beat.